This is lecture 27 for EC402. It's our last lecture, and it's going to be a bit shorter lecture. Um, I just wanted to talk about the digital audio, uh, particularly the AES standard, as it's commonly called. In your course packet, there's an article that has a bit more information than here, but um, what you need to know about it uh, is what I'll talk about today. This digital audio standard has a nice history. Before it became what we now call the AES standard, uh, the Audio Engineering Society's uh, standard, uh, it was actually developed uh, by the BBC uh, during the Cold War years. And uh, it turns out that digital audio was really hard to do back then. You talk about racks and racks of equipment to record digital and then uh, in studios that, that the BBC built all over the world. Uh, they uh, built these studios that would uh, uh, record digitally, uh, uh, master everything digitally, uh, and then uh, transmit to Britain, and then in Britain uh, do analog radio off of that. But it was a very high quality, way ahead of its time. And of course, there were nefarious reasons for doing that. It turns out it was a big honor for any country to have the BBC come in and build this uh, uh, big digital studio and plane loads of equipment would be brought in and of course the host country didn't really know that uh, what all that equipment was. It is true that some of that equipment was really for the digital radio but then there was a lot of extra equipment too uh, for all sorts of other high-tech spy operations that Britain was doing during the Cold War. So it uh, took many many years until people figured out that uh, this was a uh, very effective cover uh, for spy operations, and thus the 007 and uh, various other uh, uh, sort of British high-tech uh, stories emerged. <clears throat> in any case, um, the, uh, these high-tech studios still exist in various countries, and of course, uh, Britain was thrown out of them once people figured out that, uh, once the various countries figured out that uh, they were uh, for high-tech spy operations, but uh, they're still... Uh, uh, very high quality audio studios uh, in various countries that uh, that are available um, for other uses now. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about AES-3 digital audio. And uh, there are several different digital audio standards out there, uh, but this is a really big one. This is uh, probably the most common digital audio standard you'll see. There's certainly things like digital audio over USB, digital audio over Firewire, digital audio over uh, uh, Ethernet and that kind of thing. But um, as far as uh, a communication standard that's just for audio, this is a big one. So I want to talk about it some. Um, first of all, it's self-clocking. What does that mean? Uh, it's a... Um, communication system that doesn't have a separate bit clock signal, no uh, frame six signal. So normally, uh, uh, like I squared S digital audio, which is inner, uh, uh, integrated circuit uh, 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 digital audio. Uh, I, I, um, it's, it's supposed to have a name like I squared C. Uh, the standard isn't at all like I squared C, but in any case, it's a similar name. I squared S means inter IC sound, and it has three clocks and one data. So it has four traces on the printed circuit board. Uh, and uh, that's very different than the self-clocking self mechanism where there's really only one signal. The signal may be sent differential or not, but there's no separate bit clock, there's no frame sync. So the receiver has to figure out what this data is, what rate is it running at, and uh, what are the data bits inside it. Again, just to visit I squared S again, if you're gonna make a printed circuit board and you wanna talk between your processor or your DSP and D to A, the high quality way to do that for audio is using I squared S communications. Uh, that's very universal. So there's lots of D to A converters. Uh, you've seen D to A converters of all sorts. Many of them are for uh, instrumentation or for other reasons. In audio, you need samples that come out at very regular intervals. Uh, you want, you know, jitter on the order of picoseconds or less. Uh, so you want, you don't want a generic D to A that when the processor feels like it, it outputs a sample. Instead, you go to I squared S, which is very um, good for um, 
sample streams. And, uh, well, one of the clocks, the bit clock, tells you how fast the bits go by. It says, hey, a new bit, hey, a new bit, hey, a new bit. Um, then there's also a frame sync signal. That just tells you when does the left sample start, when does the right sample start. In a serial stream like that, you need to know, well, where does the data start? Uh, not just when do the data bits come, but uh, where do the blocks of data start? So, um, and then I squared S has a third clock, which is a super high speed clock, which is just for the convenience of the D to A chips and the A to D chips because they need to do oversample filters and various other things, so a high-speed clock is useful for them to have. Anyway, this is not like I2S. It does not have four wires. There's only a one connection, uh, and we'll talk more about that. It's variable rate, so it's very much unlike MIDI. MIDI is also a serial standard um, uh, when we studied that, but it's always at one rate. So there's no clock signal on MIDI. On the other hand, you always know it's going to be that 31.25 kilohertz. So uh, uh, it's unlike that, AES-3 can be at any rate. It's biphase encoded. And we'll talk about that encoding in more detail just because as engineers, or if you're not engineers but take an engineering class, you should know a little bit about how it's encoded. The important thing is there's no DC. So for instance, if you send a whole long sequence of zeros in a row, of zero um, data bits in a row, you don't have one voltage on the line. It, the voltage on the line is always changing. So the line, um, uh, the voltage on the line isn't just ever stuck at low voltage or at high voltage. It's always changing. And the biphase encoding guarantees that. That's very important because if you have DC, then you're, you're going to have a very limited line length. You're not going to be able to transmit very far if you um, have to keep up... Uh, um, uh, DC voltages. Um, then it's balanced, uh, or musicians would say balanced. Engineers usually say differential, but there's always the signal and the inverse of the signal. So that's really important. Uh, one of the things it does for you, it means that the uh, receiver is normally not grounded to the cable. So in that way, it's like MIDI. It doesn't have a connected ground, so you don't have ground loop problems. The receiver receives a differential signal and doesn't need to know the ground reference from the sender um, since it's differential. So that's a really big deal. Uh, means you, yeah, you minimize ground loops, very different than USB or various other things where grounds are connected on both ends. Uh, so uh, also being differential has other advantages uh, since you always have two wires twisted around each other, one is a signal and the other is a signal inverse, you have very little radiation uh, because if you are, the magnetic field, you know, when voltages change, uh, well, the one wire is changing the opposite, doing the opposite change of the other voltage, so they tend to cancel out. So it doesn't uh, inject lots of noise into other wires around it um, because it's differential, it's very noise immune. If other say there's a, you're, you're draping it over fluorescent lights or something, uh, any voltage that uh, is induced from those uh, fluorescent lights is in, induced in the signal and the inverse of the signal. So the digital receiver, that just cancels out. You don't see any of that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, the balanced uh, and or differential quality of it is very big, um, big deal. Okay, it uses XLR connectors. Way back in the day, those were small connectors. Nowadays, uh, they seem rather large. Uh, but uh, here's an X, here's a uh, AES-3 digital audio cable. There's XLR connectors. You've seen these often. Now, these are, these look a lot like your normal microphone cable connector, but it really isn't. And you have to watch, if you look on the cable here, I think you can probably see it in the video. This is a 110 ohm cable. Microphone cable is all over the map, but it's not. A, it's generally not 110 ohms. So you really want to get digital audio 110 ohm cable. And uh, you can buy this, these, uh, well, you can buy at high prices if you want, but you can also from companies like Hosa, H-O-S-A, and other companies, you can buy good cables for not very much, you know, for not any more than microphone cables, but make sure they're 110 ohms. Um, so, yes, so standard XLR analog microphone cables are not 110 ohms. So this isn't a normal microphone cable, but it doesn't have to be super expensive. Uh, you can find uh, the cables available at a very reasonable price. Uh, 
So, what does 110 ohm cable mean? Uh, something that often happens uh, when you talk to musicians, you really want to be able to explain what this characteristic impedance is because uh, if you were to take an ohm meter and take one end of the cable to the other, you wouldn't read 110 ohms, right? And, and as engineers, I might sort of make you laugh, like, okay, uh, that's not what characteristic impedance means. But uh, an easy way to explain this to musicians and, and to remind you too, if you've forgotten, is if you terminate this with a 110 ohm resistor, so if at the end of a 110 ohm cable, you put a 110 ohm termination resistor, then you get no reflections. So that's, that's what 110 ohms means. That's a simple way to define it. Uh, and uh, that's why it's so important that you use a 110 ohm cable because if it's an AES3 standard, the, the receiver and the senders, uh, you know, they're expecting 110 ohm cables and you're going to get reflections on the line. You're going to get signal problems if you don't do that. If you do 110 ohm cables and you do XLR, boy, uh, these are really uh, very, very uh, uh, noise immune and, and very reliable uh, ways to transmit audio. So differential drivers, uh, uh, for you engineers out there, uh, RS-422 uh, parts work very well for this. Uh, the drivers and receivers you'd use for RS, a differential RS-422. Um, another standard, but uh, check out those chips. Um, for example, this chip is a standard, cheap, inexpensive chip uh, that will um, work great. Now, at the ends of these cables, uh, you know, the standard says they're transformer coupled. And uh, while it's nice to follow a standard, I really think nowadays, my opinion, this isn't the standard, but my opinion is don't bother with transformer coupling. Unless you have both ends of the cables, uh, so uh, go to equipment that have matched transformers. So the transformers are made by the same company and hand-picked. Um, uh, the equipment on both ends of the cable are hand, uh, have hand-picked um, transformers that are exactly matched. It Just use capacitors. Capacitors, modern capacitors are very good. They're very small and I've had no problems at all with capacitor coupling things. What's interesting about this XLR cable is you can easily do 500 feet. Uh, I've, I've seen much longer than that. Way back in the day, and when we had a Farm Aid concert here, uh, I saw cables that must have been at least a quarter mile. They worked fine. So uh, it's a very, uh, uh, very robust standard. Um, so, yeah. So you got uh, XLR connectors. They're differentials, right? You see three pins there. One of them is a ground that connects to the shield, but on the receiving end doesn't connect to the ground of the receiving equipment. And then uh, the other two are one signal, uh, the signal, at, well, and it's inverse. So um, there you go. Uh, very easy to make an interface for this. Compared to like doing A to D converters and D to A converters, compared to doing analog interface, uh, boy, doing a digital audio interface is really, really easy. As long as your chip has support for encoding this AES standard, because this biphase encoding, you don't want to bit bang that. It's a, it would be a hassle. Uh, you really want to have a chip that has uh, support built in. Any serious DSP, for instance, would already have this built in. It's very easy to hook up. Okay. So now these cables are kind of big, especially by modern standards. And, you know, if you're... If you're in your uh, uh, living room and you're just connecting your stereo equipment together, you don't really need something this fancy. I mean, this is digital audio, right? If the digital signal arrives error-free at the other end, nothing else really matters. So if uh, for home equipment, uh, there's other varieties of this. It's the same signaling. So the bits that actually go through it are the same, but it's cheaper ways uh, to make the connection and cheaper connectors. I mean, a nice XLR connector on equipment, eh, it could easily cost you a dollar to put in, where a uh, an RCA connector, way, way, way cheaper. So here's, uh, well, this is a female RCA connector, um, but uh, yeah, an RCA connection is a much less expensive thing. So SPDIF, uh, is, uh, which is, stands for Sony Phillips something. But anyway, um, 
uh, or it's often called type 2 AES3, it's unbalanced. So it does not have differential signals. You have uh, grounds connected to both ends, um, but it's very inexpensive. And uh, you can go to about 20 feet without any problems at all. Now that's a lot less than 500 feet or more, but you know, unless you have a very big living room, 20 feet is more than you need. So that works great. And everybody's familiar with the RCA connectors. I uh, should find a male one here in a second. Yeah, so this is uh, the connector you normally see on the cable. These connectors really aren't bad, you know. Uh, well, they're not differential, so they're not as cool as XLR connectors. But if you look at these things, uh, unlike your quarter-inch connectors, which I really don't like, uh, you know, we've inherited them in the synthesizer business from the uh, late 1800s phone systems, but uh, it's, it's kind of too bad. Uh, these things have a big compression surface. So this outside here uh, has several different pieces of metal that are bent in that have a big surface area that, that uh, connects to the ground. And uh, for this pin in the middle, the other side, again, has a big surface area that connects to it, very much unlike the uh, TRS connectors, which just have one flat piece of metal against a round thing. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's SPDIF. And you'll most commonly see that. Um, it's often called SPDIF. It's also called Type 2 AES-3. Then there's a Type 3 AES-3, which is Toslink, which is optical. I'm going to show you a cable like that. Here's what one of those connectors look like. These, again, when they came out, were really, really small, but that's an optical connector. Uh, and uh, again, the signaling is the same, but here it's going through optical system, so, so through an optical fiber. The great thing about optical fiber is you are 100% guaranteed, no matter what, there will be no ground connection. And that's pretty important. So for a lot of home stuff, Toslink is very, very popular because no matter what the customer does, they're going to get a high quality, no ground loop connection. With RCA connectors, it's problematic. I mean, uh, you know, if you have a nice home stereo setup, or even a studio setup, uh, you have to be careful about ground loops and you'll sometimes get them. Uh, sometimes you won't hear anything and it's sort of luck of the draw. Um, but uh, for Toslink, you're absolutely sure you'll never get it. Uh, you can't go real far with it. 10 feet is the normal limit, um, but uh, it is pretty cool. It was also adapted by Apple for a while. They did this cool thing. And the Apple computers, uh, laptops for quite a while, um, they were putting in eighth inch connectors like these. Uh, but this one, if you look at this one closely, this isn't conductive. This is just a piece of plastic. And like I say, I don't like the eighth inch connectors because the, the connections, the single connection point is really not very good. But um, Apple, for them, what costs them is, well, how many connectors do you have on the laptop? So they had this analog connector, but this isn't even an analog connector. This is a... Uh, if you look there, you can see the tip of it is optical. So in the in that whole series of Apple laptops, you would plug this thing in uh, where your normal um, eighth inch connector goes and uh, yeah, and get optical instead. Uh, if you didn't want optical, if you wanted analog, you could plug in an analog connector, which of course is made of metal and doesn't have the light and uh, that would work too. So that's a kind of a clever connector for uh, the optical. Uh, then there's also Sony, uh, was doing this for a while. I haven't seen much equipment like this anymore, but there was, uh, the unbalanced coax. Again, it's a cheaper thing than XLR. Um, can't go real far with it. Uh, it has different impedance than cable, 75 ohm cable. Um, and it's unbalanced. Uh, so you've got ground problems and such, but again, another option. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so then for the signaling, there's also lots of other extensions, like for 5.1 audio, for THX audio, like it's used in, in uh, theaters, and that sort of thing. What we're going to talk about with the signaling 
today, which that signaling works over any of these kinds of connectors. But um, uh, we're going to talk about just stereo audio because that's probably what 90% is and the other, uh, the other types, uh, we won't worry about exactly how they're encoded. It's all very similar. They use the same signaling with some extra information bits that uh, uh, explain what, uh, what the encoding is. All right, so that's enough about cables. Uh, I did want to show you something extremely cheesy. Here is something cheesy. Uh, actually, we have similar cheese in the lab going to the A to D. But in any case, what is this? Uh, this is uh, not really something you're supposed to do, but it kind of works. Uh, this is the XLR connector, and this is an adapter, in quotes, uh, to RCA. So this is sort of like this uh, AES type 1 to uh, AES type 2. And this isn't very good. Why? Well, this end is differential and this isn't, right? And really, you should have a device in the middle here that properly converts from the differential and its cable, its uh, uh, characteristic cable impedance to the non-differential RCA. But in fact, if you're going at 48 kilohertz and... Um, 96, maybe not, but 48 kilohertz, and you're not you're going a short distance like this, and uh, a Kluge adapter cable like this does work. On the last page, I'll show some actual equipment to properly do the adapting. Uh, but I have to admit, for expedience, I've often done this instead of use the correct adapting uh, uh, circuitry. Before we get to more of that hardware stuff, though, uh, let's talk about the encoding. I want to start here at the clock period, okay? So you've only really got one signal. It may be differential or it may not be. In, in the basic AES, which I'm normally assuming AES3 uh, type one, uh, it's a differential signal. And you've got a clock period. Uh, the thing not to get confused by here is that this is because of biphase encoding. The clock period is half of a bit time. Or another way to say it is the AES clock rate is twice the bit rate. Make sure that you got that in your brain. It's not, not rocket science, but you really, really do want to understand um, this. So there's two clocks for each bit. So one bit time is called a time slot. And then you have 32 time slots make a subframe. So 32 time slots is also 64 clocks, right? Again, time slots are bits. Each bit is two clocks. Each time slot equivalently uh, to say is two, um, uh, two clocks. So a subframe is either a left or a right channel sample. And a frame is just two subframes. Uh, it is one stereo sample. And it is 64 time slots. Um, and then there's this other weird thing that, that matters, uh, not for the samples, but for extra information encoded with the stream. Every, 190, every 192 frames is called a block, okay? So every 192 frames, so basically every 192 stereo samples is called a block. And uh, the block, you don't have to worry about it too much, but you should understand why it's there. There's extra information encoded. Besides the samples, there's extra information encoded at a low bit rate, and that's what the blocks are used for. Okay, so let's look at um, this here is one subframe, either a left sample, left channel sample, or right channel sample. Um, uh, and uh, again, we're talking stereo, so left channel means the left channel of the stereo or right channel of the stereo. So what do they look like? It's 32 bit times, or uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, 32 time slots, since that's what the standard calls it. So 32 time slots. First, there's a preamble which is the startup stuff, and every single audio sample uh, has that. So every single 32-bit word has that. Uh, we won't worry about what's in the preamble right now. But then you get the least significant bit of the audio data all the way up to the most significant bit, up to 24 bits of audio. If you got less, if you only got 16 bits, well, you just make the least significant bit zero. Um, if you got 20 bits, that's good, 24 bits. Now, something to say is like, wow, you know, from the BBC developing this way back when, in the 1950s, it's kind of cool you can encode 24-bit audio. Uh, 
I mean, back then, 16-bit audio was really barely attainable. Um, but the standard was general enough and stuff that, hey, um, uh, that fits in here. 24-bit audio sample word. Least significant, most significant. And then you got this VUCP bits. So those are uh, the last four time slots or last four bit times of a subframe, where a subframe is a sample, an audio sample. So you got a 24 bit audio sample, and then you VUCP. Uh, v1 uh, means, V for one just means this is a valid frame. What it means in modern times is send this to the D to A converter. If V is zero, don't send it to the D to A converter. Um, sometimes people send all sorts of data over uh, AS3, right? It's a digital stream. And if you're already talking to equipment that's, um, you know, the equipment at the other end, you might have, I don't know what, a firmware update, or you might have some other information that you want to send over this, uh, over this cable. Then you set V to zero, and that's just sort of a uh, uh, last, you know, last second check. Look, if it's stuff that isn't intended for a speaker, uh, V is zero. So V is, uh, it says valid frame, but you know, or another way to say it is audio frame that's destined for a speaker. If V is zero, it's something else. So if you're, uh, say, a digital amplifier or something, you just ignore things with V equals zero. Often uh, connections, when they're starting up, will have a whole bunch of V equals zero frames. And the idea of that is just to let the other end sync up. Uh, right, the other end has to figure out like how fast is the bit time you know, so, so what sample rate are we running at and uh, oh, what kind of data is this and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it can do that with V equals zero frames as well as with V equals one frames. So um, until things are settled down, sometimes uh, connections will have a whole bunch of maybe a few seconds worth of V equals zero frames just to get everything synced up before um, actually sending anything to a D to A converter. Then there's a U bit. It's user defined bit field. Now, some extensions, they define it for you, but uh, most of the time in the basic AS3, you can put whatever you want there. Again, this is only one bit. Ah, but it isn't. What happens is you got this U bit here. Now, what your DSP or whatever has your processing built in, hardware built in for AS3 audio, um, your chip is going to do some magic for you. One of the things it'll do, it'll look at all of the U bits. Uh, that's 192 uh, uh, samples worth of U-bits, it'll put them all together into 24 bytes worth of channel data. And there's actually a left channel and right channel data. So there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, but you get this 24 bytes. So the one end gives 24 bytes of data, which gets sent over the whole block during the uh, block time. And at the other end, 24 bytes of data are received. So this is kind of nice. You can send extra data that way. What kind of data? I don't know. Maybe you want to send MIDI in, in addition to um, digital audio. Well, you could put MIDI data in there or you could put something else in there. Um, then there is uh, also a channel bit, which is uh, kind of like the user data, except it's predefined. They already said, hey, these bits mean this. So each block has 192 uh, C bits, just like it has 192 U bits. And those make 24 bytes of channel data um, for, for the C bits. Finally, there's a parity. The parity is just parity for this one word. Now, the parity should never be wrong. Once you're synced up, that should never be wrong. And it's just sort of a last ditch check to make sure that things aren't crazy. Um, it turns out if you're just receiving random data or something, well, the parity isn't going to happen to be right. Uh, so you'll be able to tell. But but a parity check here, it, it's a bit like, uh, well, your memory on your um, IBM PC, right? That memory on your on your uh, uh, PC all, all has parity bits. So it's always doing parity checks. And through all the years that you're using your PC, it'll probably never find an error. If it does, you blue screen. I mean, you you know, the, the thing, uh, it just stops in its tracks. Because even worse than blue screening and crashing is to keep going and munging with a machine that's totally messed up. So the parity check is really just there on your PC just to make sure, you know, as a sanity check. And that's sort of what the parity bit is here. Um, uh, it's, it's just to make sure that, that things are self-consistent and make sense.
Okay, so let's talk about the preamble here. There's um, three kinds of preambles. There's uh, an X preamble, which is for the left channel or channel one, and then Y uh, preamble, which is for channel two or right, uh, right channel. So this is left, you know, for stereo audio. I mean, this is uh, uh, left channel data is channel one, right channel data is channel two. And so the channel one, just to indicate, right, because the receiver is just receiving this bit stream, right, getting all this data. And you want to figure out, well, where does one of these uh, sample words, these 32 bit sample words, start? So this preamble here is a unique pattern which only happens at the beginning of the left channel data. Uh, or the or the first sample in a stereo sample. And uh, then the Y preamble happens on the second sample in a stereo sample. So there's X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. There's one time in, well, in a block, you have a Z. And that's in place of the X. It's just indicating, hey, this is uh, uh, a beginning of a new block. Remember, we talked about groups of blocks. Why do we even have blocks? They don't matter for the samples, but they do matter for these U and C bits. They let us, they, they let the hardware collect together for you 24 bytes worth of data of U, 24 bytes worth of data for C for each of these channels. And uh, yeah, you can use that for all sorts of purposes. It's nice to have extra data along with your audio. Sometimes it's just simple things like uh, date stamp, time stamp, location stamp, um, all sorts of things you might want to put in there. Okay, so now let's talk about the biphase encoding. And uh, this might seem a little bit confusing at first, but it, it's actually a very simple kind of encoding uh, for this kind of encoding. So uh, we have two rules. There's only two rules. A transition happens at the start of every time slot. What does that mean? Well, if you were at low voltage before, you go to high voltage at the beginning of a time slot. Now remember, a time slot is two clocks. Um, so at the beginning of this time slot, you go down. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the biphase encoding. That's just, that's the data you're encoding. So um, if you want to encode a one zero zero one one zero, um, uh, well, the first thing to notice here is I penciled in here the ones that are beginning of new bits or new time slots, right? At every penciled mark, this signal here, the encoded signal, changes from high to low or low to high. Just flip whatever the state is. That always happens every new bit or at every new time slot, okay? Transition at the t uh, start of every time slot. So every bit or every time slot starts with a change in voltage on the line. And that way, you never, even if you have a bunch of zeros in a row, if you have a bunch of ones in a row, no matter what your bit pattern is, it is impossible to ever, you know, have anything where the line stays at zero or stays at one. Uh, at most, once per bit time, uh, at least once per bit time, it's going to change. Okay, so um, then if you're encoding a one, so if you're trying to send a one data, right, you're gonna do it over two clocks, each bit takes two clocks. So if the data you're trying to send is a one, then you put a transition in the middle of the bit time or after the, after the first clock, right? So in this bit time, there's a transition, which means that you're encoding a one. In this bit time, there is no transition. So that means it's encoding a zero. This bit time, no transition encoding a zero. This bit time, there is a transition again, so you're encoding a one, a one, and a zero, right? So, so uh, there's only these two rules. It really isn't that complicated. But got a few things to remember. Those two rules, you got to remember two clocks per time slot or two clocks per bit. And at the beginning of each bit or at every second clock, there's always going to be a transition. There's an optional one at the one in between here. Depending if you're encoding a one, you do a transition. If you're encoding a zero, you don't. And so um, that's it. So it's good to do lots of examples of this for yourself if you really want to know. Like if you have zero, one, zero, one, how does that work? Well, if you're starting out high voltage, let's say, um, then uh, at the new bit here, uh, you have to do a transition. And then there's transition in the middle of the bit time because it's a one. New bit time, do a transition. Now you don't do one in the middle because this is a zero you're encoding. And here's one, so on and so forth. So again, source encoding, what does that mean? That means the actual data. Those are the data bits. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 is what you want to encode. And this is what actually gets put on the AES3 data line or the SPDIF. You know, if you put a, a oscilloscope on the SPDIF or, or on the AES3, 
this is what you would see to encode that. Um, one thing that's very important is in biphase encoding, you don't look if a signal is high, if the signal is high or low to figure out is this encoding a zero or one. Instead, you're looking at does it transition in the center of a bit or does it stay the same? So a one means a transition in the center of a bit time, zero means uh, or stay the same, uh, uh, zero is stay the same. All right, make sure that makes sense before we talk about preambles. So preamble patterns. Um, there are these three different preambles I talked about, X, Y, and Z. And the way, now what you have to do with the preambles, it has to be data that could never appear anywhere else. So the easy way to do that is make them illegal codes, right? This encoding rule is very strict here. At the beginning of every time slot, of every bit time, you have to have a transition. So for these preambles, we just break that rule. So um, uh, this is, the, remember there's four bit times, two clocks in, or, eight, or eight clocks here. And you can see here, it goes, uh, the X encoding goes, stay the same for three clocks. Stay the same for three clocks, and then change back and forth. Or if you started at low voltage, stay the same for three clocks, stay the same three, uh, three clocks, and then go back and forth. So this breaks the rules right away. You could never have this in properly encoded data because there's three in a row that are ones. So um, your X preamble uh, breaks the rules in a very particular way. Your Y preamble breaks them in a different way. Right, three in a row, but then this, the rest of it's different. Three in a row, and then the rest of it's different. So this also breaks the rules. Z also breaks the rules. Three in a row, and then this pattern. So um, it turns out that uh, uh, there's three different ways that they break the rules, making the three preambles. And uh, uh, so that way, why do you need the preambles? Why do they have to be unique? Well, the receiver... When it gets turned on, you know, and it receives, starting receiving all these bits, all, all, all these uh, signals are going one zero one zero one 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 zero. <laughs> well, where in this is the start of a sample? Where in this is the start of a of a, a frame uh, or, or a block? Uh, well, the X, Y, and Z preambles are unique, and it can find that. So, um, yeah. So again, this explains the same as I did. Make sure you understand this though. It breaks encoding rules. Now, there's another reason you need preambles and that's like, say you're just sending all zero samples. Well, if you have all zero samples, there's no transitions in the middle. And one of the nice things about preambles is it does do transitions in the middle because remember the receiver has to have some sort of phase lock loop or some mechanism by which it figures out what's the highest frequency present here. Or in other words, What's the clock rate, right? And then once it knows the clock rate, it knows, okay, two clocks per bit, and then it can start uh, trying to sync up. But uh, by having these preambles in there, also no matter what the data is, it just applies more uh, 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 stuff at, uh, um, yeah, it, it supplies transitions um, at the uh, clock rate, so you can uh, lock onto that. Okay, so understand why preambles are necessary, right? Again, you need to know where in the bitstream subframes, frames, and blocks begin. Uh, when you're receiving this data, you need to know where to start. In MIDI, we had a similar thing. Remember, we had status bytes that had the bot top bit set. Um, and then there were data bytes that had the top bit zero. And, you know, and if you're a synthesizer and you're receiving this MIDI stream, you can't tell what the data bytes are, but once you receive a status byte, that tells you, okay, you know, it, it, it tells you what the following data will be. So then you can figure out what's going on. And in a similar but different way, uh, here you need to know where do blocks start, where does the left sample start, where does the right sample start. All right. So there's channel status. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, the channel status has 192 samples or 24 bytes, and numbered 0 to 23. And uh, here's one block's worth of C bits. So this is the kind of information that you can receive. Um, there's a very important 
part here I want to jump to right at the beginning because this is one of the things that really made uh, uh, the AS3 standard work way better, uh, you know, in, in, uh, since this new millennium uh, than it did before. If the A bit is zero, the receiver will ignore the rest of these bits. So if you don't want to supply all this gunk, you don't have to, right? You can set the A bit to zero and not supply all this junk. And that's useful if you're just, you know, have a small setup and uh, you don't need the stuff. Uh, it was frustrating in the past because what would happen is if you do supply this information, you got to be kind of careful with it. Uh, if you read through all these things, a combination of these fields here, for instance, tells the receiver what the sample rate is. Say, it's telling the receiver it's 96 kilohertz sample rate. Well, that's nice, but the receiver, just in order to receive this at all, already figured out it was 96 kilohertz. It had to, uh, in, uh, because it had to... Uh, uh, figure out what the bit times were, as we talked on the previous page, right? It, the receiver has to, by a phase-locked loop or some other mechanism, figure out what is the highest frequency, uh, transition frequency present here, and figure out um, what is the clock rate of this, or the half-bit time of this. And uh, so it's already figured out what the sample rate is from that. And so this is sort of redundant information that's, you know, and what happens if your sample rate appears to be 96.2 kilohertz, but this thing says it's 96? Well, then uh, by the original rules of AES, uh, if you fill in this data, it better be correct, and the receiver is supposed to just go into error state if something is wrong, uh, which can be very, very frustrating for the user <laughs> because... Um, uh, yes, um, in any case. Uh, so you can set this to zero. If you don't set it to zero, though, there's other useful things you can put in here. For instance, say you have a big studio and uh, say you're doing, uh, I don't know what, uh, some big event. Um, it's very nice that there is uh, alphanumeric characters here. So you only got four characters, but you can describe where is this data coming from, where is it supposed to be going, and some other information, uh, uh, stamp information. So this is super useful, like if you have a mega mixing board, say you're at the Oscars and you have to mix 90 channels of microphones and, uh, and other audio signals, um, uh, digital audio signals, it's super useful that each one of them is labeled in itself for what it is. That can appear on a little display in your mixing board so you right away know that you know what's going on um, and uh, what it is you're mixing in this column. So that, that can be very useful. Um, yes. So that's kind of cool. So down here, uh, EQR specify sample rate, and they must exactly match the AES sample stream. Uh, that can be a pain. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, I always found it quite frustrating when I know I'm sending the right data and the receiving equipment errors out because it thinks I'm off by a tenth of a percent in frequency or something. Uh, so uh, uh, you don't have to deal with that if you don't want to. All right, and then to finish up here, um, here's some hardware for how you could uh, uh, implement this in inter the interconnecting cable for AS3, so for the XLR version, the Type 1 version, um, is uh, 110 ohms. It's differential, uh, twisted pair differential with shield. Um, and uh, yes, so you have the signal and it's inverse, driven on the two wires and then received that way. Um, on this end, you normally do not connect the ground. So I'm happy to give you circuitry for that if you ever want to do this. Just make sure your chip does the biphase encoding for you. If your chip doesn't do that, then this is a hassle. You really want to select a, a DSP or a processor chip that has that built in. There are proper ways to convert, like I was showing you the Kluge cable before. Here is 110 uh, to uh, SPDIF. Uh, cheesy. That's not how you're supposed to do it. If you really do it right, um, here you have a uh, transformer coupled and you have impedance matching and you'll get better results with this. Like if you do this, you can certainly go to uh, 96 uh, kilohertz or even 192 kilohertz. And uh, if you use that cheesy cable I showed you, uh, I wouldn't trust it for over 48 kilohertz uh, sample rate. So uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, cheater cable. Yes, I showed that. And then here we've got uh, 
bit of the tossling. So this is, again, uh, uh, how do you do this connection to optical? Uh, it's not hard to interconvert. You can buy little interconversion boxes, uh, you know, like this thing here is an inexpensive one. Um, uh, if, if you really do need to interconvert, uh, usually though, you end up just by getting equipment that all uses the same thing that all uses RCA or that all uses, uh, the XLR, the type one, or that all uses Toslink. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the semester and I'll talk to you later.